thank you very much. And many thanks to Professor Ibn uh, Al-Mahini and his hard-working team, uh, Hamdi, Adil, Nadia. It's an honor uh, to be here to participate uh, in this conference, and I do look forward to future collaboration. Listening to the lectures over the last couple of days, I feel a little bit like a tourist who ends up in London and wants to go to Buckingham Palace and gets lost. So he asks the taxi driver how to get from where he is to Buckingham Palace, and the taxi driver gives him a whole series of long, complicated instructions and then says, but I wouldn't go from here if I were you. <laughs> but this is where we are, and the place to begin, I think, is to define what we mean by social media, which, and I give you a quote, refers to the use of web-based and mobile technologies to turn communication into interactive dialogue, and note the word dialogue. This is not my definition, but the definition from an example of modern technology that we all use, Wikipedia. Only established 10 years ago, it's quoted from one of 19 million articles from 91,000 contributors in over 200 languages. Then I entered the term interfaith dialogue into the Google search engine. I received 1,940,000 hits, or results, I should say. And I was one of 2 million people at that minute who entered the search into Google. So these are two examples of many that we've heard over the last couple of days that indicates this seismic and generational shift that has taken place since 1990 when the British scientist Tim Berners-Lee helped invent the World Wide Web. There have been three phases of the internet evolution. We're not talking the first phase, the one-to-one -one connections that is in the 1980s, or the one-to-many connections, that is Google, Wikipedia, and so many what we are talking about is this third stage, the very recent stage, Facebook established in 2004, YouTube 2005, and Twitter in 2006. And so what we have are exponential growth of these sites in the last five years, where the website owner has lost control to the website user. In other words, this is a massive and revolutionary democratization of information, where everyone is a publisher and everyone a critic. Sites often have no editors, and users, that is you and me, are expected to edit inappropriate or inaccurate content. And this collaborative process demonstrates the challenge to traditional hierarchies. Individuals communicate their own interpretations of events or texts rather than rely on the accounts of their leaders, religious or political. <laughs> this transformation has massive implications for religious authority. Just a couple of generations ago, the priest was not only the moral and spiritual authority, but representative of the true religion and its true scriptures, but probably also the most educated. He, and it was almost certainly a he, spoke with authority on a wide variety of issues that were important to the society of his day. Contrast that with today's situation. Rarely are priests approached as big as authority, except perhaps within their own congregation. The internet and social media are now the primary authorities for information. With the traditional media, radio, television, newspapers, a distant second. For many American Christians, beliefnet.com is a bigger authority on matters of Christian belief and practice than a priest. According to Philip Clayton, writing in the Princeton Theological Review this year, whilst 40 years ago people were influenced about religious matters by their priests and editorials in the religion section of their local newspaper today, Online blogs are a far greater influence. Unfortunately, this democratization of information and the increase in user-generated content also makes it easier for misinformation and negative content to proliferate online. And in addition, 
Access to a wide range of media makes it easy for local issues to attract global attention. For example, one controversy in a region of Pakistan or India can have significant impact on the streets of Bradford or London just a few hours later. And in the Royal Vincent Hughes training of Metropolitan Police Officers, the speed of the continental transfer of attention is a topic of increasing concern. According to a recent Berkeley study, there are presently over 30,000 churches on my church, Facebook's leading religious application. Many churches use Facebook to build a sense of community within the parish, providing updates on the community in a forum where members can reach out to one another for support. These increasingly include podcasts of sermons, sometimes called Godcasts, easily downloaded by congregants and played during periods of leisure. Facebook provides a network for users to join or create groups and is ideal for holding discussions within a trusted circle of friends. However, these closed networks do not make it an effective tool for broadcasting content and engaging the wider public. YouTube reached over 700 billion playbacks in 2010. Today, 48 hours of video are uploaded every minute, resulting in nearly eight years of content daily. When I search for this faith dialogue on YouTube, I received about 3,500 results. And one example before you is a synagogue, which uses YouTube to upload songs and liturgies so that congregants can learn the necessary tunes and words before Shabbat or special services. And although YouTube may successfully engage and share content in the public space, its public commenting format makes it a less than ideal tool for dialogue. And as for the youngest of the three, Twitter, there are over 100 million accounts, 55 million tweets sent daily, and the number of Twitter users increasing 300,000 every day. And considering the fact that the first tweet was sent on March the 21st, 2006, this represents astonishing growth. However, of all the social media, Twitter is probably the most limited in terms of fostering interfaith dialogue because of its 140 character per post restriction and its one-way communication channel. Now, although these figures are astonishing and even revolutionary, social media does not create physical revolutions. People create revolutions, not the technology they use. Similarly, social media in itself has no inherent positive or negative influence on interfaith dialogue. The impact of the social media depends solely on the people who use it and how they use it. In other words, it's not the media itself, but the motive of its users that is important. The less personal nature of online communication also makes it easier for information to be distorted or misinterpreted, and this can impact negatively on interfaith dialogue and serves to confuse what the word dialogue means as well as the nature of dialogue activity. A casual conversation face to face or online between Jews, Christians and Muslims that may add up to no more than a loose statement of entrenched theological positions is sometimes claimed to be dialogue. It is not. Communication between persons of different religious points of view is not dialogue. Dialogue is not simply synonymous with communication. For dialogue to take place, there must be a genuine hearing of the other. And hearing, my friends, is not the concern of many users of social media. And once the message is posted online, control is lost, and someone else may interpret what you are trying to achieve as something else. Creating a constructive dialogue, fostering real understanding, begins with building bridges and establishing what is held in common. By beginning with commonality, Muslims, Christians and Jews can achieve minimum levels of knowledge, resulting in trust and sensitivity. And here, the social media can make a contribution. For example, in the United States, many Muslim websites have been established, as we heard yesterday, to confront harmful anti-Muslim stereotypes that have emerged since 9-11. American Muslims are using social media to help others 
understand their faith and to promote a positive image of Islam. For example, in 2001, the website called Islam.com was established to promote awareness amongst Muslims and non-Muslims about issues regarding the Muslim world, and now has a readership of 2 million and is at the forefront of an emerging independent Muslim media in the West. So, the social media should be viewed as a valuable resource for Jews, Christians and Muslims, since they share many of the same reasons, both positive and negative, why it is important to engage in interfaith dialogue. Some may spark the defensive reasons to respond to ignorant and negative stereotypes, since the lack of knowledge provides a seedbed for prejudice demonstrated by increasing Islamophobia, anti-Christian prejudice, and anti-Semitism, both outside and within our communities. And that's what makes the work of centres like the Doha International Centre for Interfaith Dialogue, my own and yours, so important for the pursuit of knowledge and furthering understanding and overcoming prejudice and ignorance. Although online communication is of a less personal nature than face to face, and the virtual world will only ever be virtual, it is important that social media is integrated into the practice of interfaith dialogue. And there are examples of good practice, as social media can connect users with those with whom they cannot physically communicate. I cannot call the Archbishop of Canterbury every day and ask him for his views on a certain event or a theological conundrum, but I can follow him on Twitter, as I can the Chief Rabbi, and as I can the Muslim Council of Great Britain. Although social media provides an excellent learning opportunity from those who have a different perspective than you, in reality, does it happen very often? When virtual communities are formed, how often do we include those who we disagree with? How often do Israelis and Palestinians follow each other on Twitter, or friends each other on Facebook. The overall trend is that people talk to people with whom they agree. There is not much interaction between the Salafis, the Sufis, and the Shias. The technology may exist, but you still need someone with a will, curiosity, and empathy. And this leads me to the conclusion that it is not the medium of social media itself, but the motive of users that are most important. Successful interfaith dialogue depends on the substance of the conversation. The second and third phases of the internet of the internet evolution have no inherent positive or negative power. Online tools themselves do not make people more or less tolerant. The impact of the social media on the interfaith dialogue depends on the people who use them and how they use them. Thank you very much.